Hello writers, welcome to How Do You Write, episode number seven. And today I'm going to jump right into the interview. Um, I have not been doing too, too much except for writing a lot. I taught um, a publishing class at Stanford last week. And by the time you're listening to this, I think I will just be getting back from a conference. Um, So we're just going to jump into the interview with Arisa White, who is a writer who lives in my town, Oakland, and I found this interview absolutely gobsmackingly, jaw-droppingly inspiring. I think that you're going to, too. Um, It reminds me that we need to connect with all types of writers. I am so firmly in the the novelist world that I would say 95% of my writing connections are with other novelists. And... um, And as I say in the interview, I do think that poetry is the hardest form to master. So I have this kind of hero worship already for poets. Uh, The hardest class I ever took when I was getting my master's um, was a poetry class that they almost kicked me out of because I couldn't write anything but narrative prose. Even when I wrote something that almost rhymed, they'd be like, no, you're you're starting a novel here. So um, I I just failed so spectacularly on that. Um, Arisa has made me feel real big feelings about the marriage of our work to our lives and um let's jump in because you're gonna love this so enjoy all right well welcome listeners i'm here with arisa white and so excited to interview her she is a cave Canem fellow a sarah lawrence college alumna and an mfa graduate from the university of massachusetts amherst she's the author of the poetry chat books disposition for shininess Post Pardon and Black Pearl, and she was nominated for Pushcart Prizes in 2005 and 2014, so wow. Um, she's a native New Yorker living in Oakland, California, my hometown. Arisa is a faculty advisor at Goddard College and was awarded a 2013-14 cultural funding grant from the city of Oakland to create the libretto and score for Post Pardon, the opera, which is amazing. And forthcoming in fall 2016 is the full-length collection, You're the Most Beautiful Thing That Happened, at, that's coming from Augury Books. Arisa, welcome. Thank you so much for being with me today. Thank you for having me, Rachel. You have an amazing bio. I had to like call out amazing <laughs> awards and fellowships and grants and everything that I wanted to read, but then it would be like a 30 minute show. <laughs> you're, you're very impressive. And I've got like, I'm kind of starstruck right now. Oh, wow. Plus I, I must say that poets are always, I think to me, the, the most amazing writers there are. I really think that novels are hard, short stories are harder and poetry is the hardest thing to write. Well, thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> Okay, getting into our process, um, what is the best time of day for you to write? Oh wow, I, I've been I've been thinking about this. So, huh, I mean, some it, it changes actually. Like you know, I think like now, now the like I'm not thinking of time necessarily as like morning, afternoon, or night, but for some reason, I think my body. Is like it's Wednesday. You write all day. It's Saturday. Oh. You write all day. So I guess my times are Wednesday and Saturday. <laughs> Interesting. And I think it's it's changed because um, you know now I'm working more and I have to read papers and edit stuff and yeah. you know participate on committees and so um, I just think sort of something happens during the week where. I just get tired of like looking at other people's stuff and then the middle of the week Wednesday sort of feels like the right time to take attention for my work and so I'll wake up in the morning have tea and pretty much focus on either writing something new or a lot of revision for some reason when I'm overwhelmed revision seems to be like the best thing for me I don't know why maybe it's this way of Reseeing my life, I have some control again, mm-hmm. um, and so in in Saturday is the same thing too. It's it's really kind of beautiful, and I think it's because I need these concentrated moments of time since I haven't been on a retreat in the last two years. So that's kind of my my 
my like creative muse being like, pay attention, give us a day. I love that. You know how people talk about the creative muse coming to you every day at 9 a.m. if that's when you sit at the desk? Mm -hmm. You know, it seems like your body now knows that Wednesday and Saturdays are your day and she shows up for you. Yeah. I've never heard anyone say that. I love that. Okay. And how do you write? Computer um, or longhand? Definitely longhand. I oh. carry notebooks around. I have little receipts and napkins and I write and the poetry books I'm reading <laughs> or, you know, or some philosophy, whatever I'm reading, it's all like poems in the margins and, you know. <laughs> Sometimes I don't finish the books because I, I have too much to write after. <laughs> That's awesome. I love that transgressive feeling of writing in books, too. I really, I was just doing that yesterday. I really enjoy it. <laughs> and, um, and so then, so usually, um, so it's all about emotion for me. I think that the physical act of, of pencil or pen to page just really gets something moving in me. Um, and so it's more emotional. And then sort of like, you know, those moments when you start like thinking about words, like, oh, emotion has motion in it. So of course I'm having more of a emotional process when I'm writing because there's there's movement in that. And so I think I do about like my first draft and then um, my second, third, maybe even fourth draft is sort of like written in my journal in the margins. And when the paper, can no longer contain whatever it is I'm, I need it to hold. I then go to the computer. So then there's a draft that's written on the computer. Then I print out right on the pages mm. again. And then we go back to the computer. How much revision is only on the computer? The least um, amount, it sounds like, maybe? or No, I would say the most amount happens um, if, well, we're thinking about the computer, too, is the printout of the poem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I would say just I think a lot like most of my revision happens about 85 percent on computer on printouts of the poems. Yeah. Oh, how interesting. Yeah. I love that. And where do you write most and why? Uh, I think on the couch and in the kitchen. So um, in your home, you don't you don't go to the cafe, you don't. I, I mean, you know, I kind of think I'm going to go to a cafe and, <laughs> and I'm just sort of like complaining about like how loud the music is and I'm too busy people watching or oh, so yeah. I can't necessarily do like creative writing in a space where people are because I'm too inspired by them. Yeah. Um, so usually, like, if I'm in a cafe, that's because I'm either feeling stuck in my work, and so I need to be around people to kind of get something going. And so maybe I'll, like, jot down ideas or, like, oh, I worked out that line in my head by watching so-and-so eat a scone like a beast, you know, like, whatever <laughs> it is. So, yeah, so I think, like, Mostly it's in my house, like the initial thoughts happen in, in my house, in my kitchen while I'm cooking dinner or whatever meal. I just have notebooks all around the kitchen and pens and little notepads and things like that. So there's a notebook wherever I like to be in, in the house. Um, but then if I'm out, I always have a notebook just to jot things down because um, sometimes It'll start at home, but sometimes I'll get finished in the process of going to work or coming home or things like that. This is just a curiosity on my own part. Um, do you ever use your phone or anything to catch those kind of, does a poet do that, a poet like you do that, or do you, is it always written down? In my romantic head, I see it written down. <laughs> well, lately, I, you know, I got like a, a new like touchscreen phone, so... Um, this like the past six months I've been using the memo feature um, and just kind of trying like whatever that is <laughs> the, vo the voice memo um, sometimes or I've done vo voice memos yeah. um, but only because if I was like working on a speech or something so I somehow the voice memo made sense yeah. but if I but no it's like the little type one okay. like a little yeah. notebook memo thing so I've just been jotting down ideas with that but the problem with that is I forget to go back to my phone. So it's not really in my consciousness to be like, go to your phone and get your notes, unless it was like some really 
badass poem that I was working on and I, I remember instantly. So I have to like remember to retrieve the information from there. I have had that exact problem where I go in like months later and I'm like, that was a great idea. I had no idea I had that idea. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and how do you refill the creative well? Um, a few ways. Um, one, by doing nothing. I really like bad TV. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, all the TV's bad. You know? I know. Like, even the documentaries, they're all bad. But, like, yeah, um, it is a sense of, like, everyone's trying to give you a point of view. And so I like that to, like, watch TV and be like, oh, my God, they're brainwashing me in this way. How can I disentangle myself from these thoughts? <laughs> it's such good thoughts. I wish I wrote that. So, like, I like watching commercials and sort of, like, paying attention to, like, how things are created. And my yeah. wife gets so upset with me when I'm already figured out the plot and this character is going to do this and watch this character say this. And then blah, blah, blah. It's just, like, shut up. <laughs> I don't want to talk. I just, you know, we're both trying to numb out. So, for me, it's a whole different kind of numbing. Um so that I love watching TV, um, hanging out with my friends. I think I, you know, I work at home, I write at home. So I have to remind myself to like go out and pretend that I'm human and I like social interaction and things like that. So I do that. Yeah. And, um, and so just my friends are smart and they're, they're beautiful people and they have so much going on in their lives. And so just to sit and listen and kind of reconnect in that way um, definitely restores something like that kind of human connection of things, things that, that bridging of, of life that yeah. makes my poetry possible. And then also I, there's this um, online group uh, called The Daily Grind. And so I've been signed up with them since like 2008. And uh, over the years, they've expanded their offerings. So before it was just like everyone who writes poetry. But now you can do um, poetry, just revision, new poetry, prose. And then my favorite is um, Manic Mixture, which is like anything, photography, collage, your uh, syllabus, oh, <laughs> your cool. descriptions. And so I've been liking that the most because what it reminds me is that writing is a part of my everyday life. Mm -hmm. So like when I'm putting together that course description, it, it has just as much like uh, just as much as of me and my poetic language as say a poem does. Right. So I'm beginning to like not necessarily create these separations between my poetry self and my sort of scholarly personal essay self mm -hmm. but they're all interwoven and what that allows me to do is start to see my poetry as the basis for all of my other writing and so that is where my voice is rooted and so I begin to practice that poetic voice in my you know essay writing and my scholarly writing and my libretto writing and you know prose and things like that so that's been this really fascinating way for me to to like um feel um rejuvenated because there's not a separation the moment that i begin to think of myself in these divisions is I feel like that's where most of the pain and the sense of disconnection happens. And I feel like, what the hell am I doing? You know, but if I'm a poet in everything I do in the way I love and the way that I'm a wife and the way that I'm a teacher, something is really restorative about that. I have to, I, I don't have anything as wonderful as I want to say to that because I think you just literally blew my mind right <laughs> open and I think I really needed to hear that I've only been a full-time writer for the last four months I've always had uh -huh. a, a day job and I'm and I'm really kicking myself on the days that I'm working on you know a class plan but I'm not writing and mm -hmm. um and I think you just changed a whole yeah. attitude for me because I'm you. just doing that too I'm like yeah. well I'm rah, rah, rah. <laughs> you know, yeah really pissy about it but then I realized, like, oh, wait, no, no, no. You're, you're doing the thing that creates so much violence in the world to yourself. You're dividing mm -hmm. and monetizing and doing all of that. And so, of course, then you're going you're gonna to approach everything with this kind of angst and irritation. And then when you 
go to your poetry or whatever creative thing, you're coming with that same kind of interaction as well. So how how to like break that down more and more so that like I remain fluid in all that I do. That is incredibly gorgeous. Thank you for that. Wow. <laughs> okay. Um, what secret writing tip of awesomeness did you discover the hard way? I almost want to say that you just answered that. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, there's like two, like there's two things that came to mind. Um, one was, and I think to kind of like piggyback off of what I just said, and I was thinking about this in the kitchen when I was making dinner last night. Um, I think the one thing that we forget and um, is that we're in love with this. And um, and because when we forget we're in love with this work, however challenging, it's just, it's our, it's our beauty. But when we forget it, when we forget this love, we then make choices as if we don't love ourselves, right? So, you know, so I feel like if you prioritize that poetry is my love, I, then my choices will match that. Like, you know, the behaviors I do will match that. Because sometimes I made choices thinking like, oh, I'm whatever. Like, poetry doesn't necessarily matter. Um, and then I find myself in these situations or relationships where the other person sort of treats my poetry like it's not important to me. Um, and then I begin to do that. And then there's just, just like this angst and I'm just mad at everyone. So that's something I had to learn the hard way. Um, and then when I was at Breadloaf, um, when was I? I think it was like in 2003 or something. And I was on scholarship. I was like one of the wait staff people. And I was taking a class. And one, I was taking a class with, with Steve Orlin. And um, his, like, because they pair them up with these other poets. Mm -hmm. Um, in their workshops, and so the fellow who was paired up with Steve, um, we were going over a poem of mine, and um, and the people were like, why did you make this choice? And I was just like, whatever. And they were like, why did you do this line? But I was like, oh, no, it just came to me. And um, and then after that, the, the fellow, and I totally forget his name, he came up to me, he's like, Arisa, you know what you are doing. You are very much aware of, of, of what you're putting into the work, what you're choosing to take out. Um, and so what he, and in that moment, I was just like crying and I don't know why, but he was just so very clear and direct and no one ever like spoke to me in that manner. And so, and it wasn't like mansplaining either. So I want to make that very clear. It was like a moment of a poet, an older poet to a younger poet, um, just awakening me to my choices and my intention to sort of stand firmly with, with right. what I create. Right. And so to be able to say like, oh, I chose this word and be clear about it, I may not know how it may affect the reader, but I know what I was doing as a craftsperson. Right. And so to, to sort of claim that power, to like hold it and to sort of like speak up and voice even, you know, for the poem. And, you know, so it was just this moment of, of empowerment to kind of really to allow myself to be the poet that creates poetry in the world who knows how to do it you, you really, <laughs> yes, really know how to do it yeah who really yeah honoring, I, honoring that knowledge i think totally oh. completely oh, and to, then, to honor it then i can share it with other people too so it was it was like a really eye-awakening moment for me heart-wakening too i love that thank you and can you give us a quick craft tip of some sort um I, you know for me I think it's like really important to talk out loud mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and so you know when you're in that point where you're you, you're just struggling with whatever it is like you just stopped or you've hit a wall I think it's good to sort of imagine that wall as something you can speak to or imagine that doubt or that fear as, as a conversation to be had um, out loud with yourself in the privacy of your office or wherever in the bathroom or the bathtub or shower, but begin to talk back to it because I think those moments where we stop, we have no language. 
and or something is so unspoken that you need to develop the ABCs before you can begin to construct the word and then the sentence, right? So I think that's this moment to kind of go back to your beginner's mind, your child self, that inquisitive part of who you are and begin to have that conversation to say, what's up? Like, what's going on? Why? Why do I feel this way? Why is, you know, hey, character, why are you not Mm -hmm. doing what I want you to do? Like, are you afraid? Is this not where you need to go? You know, just talk out loud. Does your wife know what you're doing when you're doing that? Or does... (laughs) She's like, why are you in there talking? Like, yeah. And then and she's in the living room, and I'm like, oh my god, yeah, you know. And then she's like, what are you saying in there? I'm like, I'm talking to myself. You're interrupting me. I'm working through this issue. It's funny. My wife is not a writer, but she's an artist, and she tends to talk to herself more than I do. So I'm constantly walking past her office, saying, what did you? Are you? Is that to me? Or to the dog. <laughs> okay. Uh, and and in conclusion, what would you like to tell us about that you're working on right now? Or that's coming out uh, soon? Well, I just, I mean, what's really exciting is just the other day I was um, just asked to co-write a children's book in verse. Oh, so cool. I'm so excited about that. Like, I've always wanted to do that. And I'm really appreciative that Aya De Leon, another fellow writer, recommended me for, for this. Uh, oh, so, cool. um, so... I have um, my third uh, full-length poetry collection, You're the Most Beautiful Thing That Happened, is coming out in October, and I'm really excited for it. Um, It's the most queerest book I I wrote, very, very, very gay, very lesbian. Can't wait. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And so, yeah, so I'm kind of excited because that's a part of sort of like... um, Uh, my identity that I haven't really written into and out of and sort of thought about language surrounding, you know, being queer, being gay, being lesbian. And, and, and so this book is kind of exciting for me in that regard. And, um, and then Lit Quake will be hosting a conversation uh, with myself and Robin Costa Lewis, who is um, this year's uh, poetry winner for the uh, National Book Award. So I'm really excited wow. for the conversation to happen um, in the beginning of October as a sort of like soft launch for the book in San Francisco. Okay, listeners will be listening back to these podcasts as they come across them. So um, in, by October 2016, listeners, I will have the link up for the new book and all of Arisa's other links. Arisa, where can we find you online? Um, at arisawhite.com. Um, yeah, that's the best place. And I have links to a whole bunch of other stuff, okay. workshops that I'm doing and publications and such. Perfect. I cannot thank you enough. I feel rejuvenated in a, I, the, the, the news has been awful. As oh God. Knows. And I just, I was just so heavy hearted this morning and I'm just so inspired now talking to you and I want to get back to the page so I know that you're going to have that effect on my listeners thank you Arisa thank you so much Rachel I hope to meet you in person since we're in the same town I would love to meet you as well thank you Arisa have a wonderful day same to you Rachel bye bye